Israel is a flourishing democracy with Hadassah Hospital and pluralism, right, at the very center of the society. It's this tiny little country which has a code of ethics for its army. The whole thing is imperfect. The whole thing is holy and broken hallelujah. But there is a battle between good and evil. And we can trust, right, our deepest heart's desire, which incarnates our moral compass. We can't have Hamas hijack God. The God of Hamas is a distorted and degraded God, which is idolatrous, which serves tragically, right, the degraded forms of the great impulse of goodness that is the spark that's at the heart, the original heart of every great system of value, of every great system of religion, of religare, of reconnecting. This is a, a difficult day. And it's, it's hard to know, you know, how to begin. And so I want to, with your permission, I want to try and kind of find our way here and understand where we are. And to do that, not by giving a, a kind of political analysis of the day, of the tragedy, really the horror that's unfolding in Israel, although we will talk about that. Because there is no political analysis that's separate from, that's in any way distinguishable, for, distinguishable from the deeper conversation that we've been having here in one mountain, many paths since we began. Little blessing I made. There's a little blessing we make before drinking. We're supposed to make it before drinking, but I made it on the other side uh, after drinking. It actually comes before. It's a very beautiful Hebrew wisdom practice of making a blessing before we drink anything. So cheers, everyone. And I'm beginning particularly slowly because you almost don't know where to start. And so I'm I'm a little bit just laconic and slow, and I'm pouring myself some Celsius. I've kicked Diet Coke. And my friend Daniel said that Celsius was completely healthy. So I'm having some Celsius here, and I'm even in the midst of tragedy and an existential risk. I'm extremely proud of myself for having kicked Diet Coke. So, so cheers, everyone. I already made a blessing in the first one, so you don't make a second blessing. So one, the other reason I'm moving slowly is that I, I was up all night. I didn't sleep. My son, Yair, has been here with me. And Yeah, Ear is an incredibly beautiful young man. The qualities that are so missing in much of the sophisticated cultural conversation, he incarnates all of them in spades. He is sincere, just in this incredible way. He experiences and he, he is an incarnation of devotion He is filled with integrity. He's kind. And he's kind. He's generous. 
He has a heart that, that overflows. He's also been a commander of commandos in different positions in the Israeli army. And he's now in his early 30s, which in the Israeli army is ancient. But to get a sense of what's going on, he was called back to his unit, to his boys. And so I, at about 3 a.m., you know, walked him to a, a car service that we got to pick him up here in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont to take him to Burlington to get an 11 o'clock flight to Israel, which he's now on, in order to, to join the fighting. Back in 2008, my other son, I have three sons and a daughter, my other son, Eitan, was vis visiting me in Salt Lake City. Myself, Eitan and um, Diane, Di Hamilton, you know, we spend a beautiful with Michael, Michael Zimmerman, we spend a beautiful Sabbath talking in the, the depth of the snow of Utah. I was so thrilled to have Eitan with me. It was at a heartbreaking moment in my life. And then an earlier Gaza conflict broke out. You know, Eitan left after being, you know, for 36 hours with me. Again, I walked him to, to a car, to a cab, and he flew back to Israel. He went directly into battle. He was also a commander of commandos. He went directly into battle. A house-to-house -house battle in Gaza in which many Israeli soldiers were killed because the Israeli army has followed a code of ethics in a situation which is beyond impossible that I've never, and I've researched this my entire life, I've never seen any army come close to in which they give full warning in every possible way to clear civilians out of the way of operations which are designed to essentially stop what is pure terrorism. It's not anything else other than that and that needs to be understood and I'm going to explain what that means. And so Eitan has described to me, you know, what happens when, you know, you go into a house Right, in order to, and you try and clear people out and you walk into the house and you'll have a baby put in front of you. The soldier steps back because the soldier is trained in ethics and doesn't want to hurt a baby. And in that stepping back, the soldier is often killed because that's the instant, right, of, of decision. So Aton left my house, went into Gaza, he describes, he never talks about it, but in those two weeks, he was essentially on the ground, you know, heavily armed, trying to navigate deep existential threat to, to Israel's existence. And, you know, I read it over this morning. Everyone should take a look at it. You can find it online the charter of Hamas, which is aligned with Iran. Iran that's been involved in the last year in the slaughter of its own women teenagers for daring to assert their autonomy as women, as human beings. 
Masha Amin, we've talked about what's happened in the last year in Iran. And so Iran, representing the most brutal repression of the feminine, of eros, of goodness, truth, and beauty, is actually responsible for both the Hezbollah on the north border of Israel, for all of the terror cells on the west bank of Israel, for the terror cells in Lod and Ramla in central Israel, which is a tiny country, right, and for an extensive Hamas terror organization in Gaza, whose commitment is, and please just go online and read of the charter of Hamas, the commitment is to have no negotiated settlement, no peace, no sharing of land, no shared story of value, no possibility of coexistence, right? The charter is clear that only the, the annihilation of Israel and only the restoration of the entire region as an Islamic state based on the most fundamentally human violating principles of the most repressive and ugly versions of medieval Islam, only their triumph will actually satisfy the prophet. A little shocking, right? It's like, wow, like, how do you even begin a conversation? How do you begin a conversation? Right, and see if we can we can stay with us, friends, okay? It's deep. It's deep. So the first thing that we have to say is, so my son is in Gaza for two weeks, and he, he basically wrote then, and hasn't talked about it since. I didn't talk to him about it till late last night at about 4 a.m. in the morning, my time. But wrote then he didn't expect to leave Gaza alive. He left Gaza alive after two weeks. He was shocked. And he said to me that when he when he left Gaza and returned to the marketplace in in Jerusalem, he was shocked that that the ordinary world still existed. And then a couple of days later, just the explosive nature of the entire situation and the almost the inability to hold it in the body. There's no words for it. All right, he was then in a car accident, you know, two days later. And, you know, wound up in Tel Shomer Hospital and I got a call saying that he would never walk again. And Eitan is, is a fierce, like his brother Yair, is filled with goodness and integrity and generosity and fight, right? A kind of deep, deep fight and a deep commitment and Eitan not only decided he was going to walk again, but multiple operations later, he's run 10 marathons around the world competitively and opened right an educational institution in Israel, which trains people in good thinking and good moral thinking and philosophy through running, through training and running. So, so yay Eitan, right? Yay Eitan. So that was the last time I walked my son in 2008 to a battle. And now we just walked Yair and Yair is now in the air to Israel. So I'm just sharing the context. I just want to share the context with you. So, so Yair got on a plane, you know, at about 6.30, he's connecting to Israel. And mad blessings to Yair. Mad blessings to Yair and mad blessings to every single person in Israel. Every single man, woman, and child. And, and I want to try and talk about this. And I want to try and talk about this. Okay, I want to try and talk about this. Right? In a way that actually begins to do sense making because there's, it's so impossible to talk about. 
so first, I'm going to say the first thing. You, you can't talk about this without all of the larger issues that we've been discussing. That's one. Here, here we begin. And thank you for, for listening to my, my talking slowly. One is that I haven't slept, um, but, but two is that the situation in Israel is so unbearably painful. Just like the situation in Ukraine is so unbearably painful. And we have to not look away. You know, and my, my beloved friend, Elena, you know, has been a deep partner in, with me in looking towards the Ukraine. And we wrote a book on the Ukraine in the first four weeks. We, we need to look towards Israel. And we need, need to look towards the very fabric of the social existential spiritual fabric of reality and understand what is actually happening here. So here's number one. Here's number one. Without establishing a field of value, in which value is real, number one, and there's a shared ground of value, a shared grammar of value, and that there's some sense in which that value is not just made up, it's not just a political creation, it's not just a social construction, but actually we align with value, value lives in us. We have to listen deeply and clarify our interior to actually listen to the voice of value to which we have direct access. And we can actually trust our direct access to that value that lives inside and that that value lives inside every human being. And we can actually listen to that voice of value and trust it and trust it as it moves in us as the mysteries live within us, without that possibility, without that shared ground of value in which we participate, which lives in us, as us, and through us, value which both evolves through us and at the same time value before which we bow, right? We bow before value or we bow before the mystery. We encounter the mystery and the mystery incarnates as value, as goodness, as truth, right? As beauty as as the field of ethos and eros which is one because what eros means is the experience of radical aliveness seeking desiring deeper contact and greater wholeness right? that's what eros is and that means that eros and ethics are the same thing ethics is the experience of radical aliveness seeking desiring ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. That's what ethos is. So there's no split between eros and ethos. And we're committed to creating, to generating, to fostering, to supporting a field of eros and ethos that supports all of life. That is the ground for any conversation. Without that ground, we can't have a conversation. And number one, number two, there are better and worse expressions of eros and ethos. There's not moral equivalents, right? You can't just erase distinctions and erase any notion of distinction can't do that. You have to be willing to do the deep work of collecting truth. And truth, yes, there are multiple perspectives. When people have an argument, there are a bunch of perspectives in an argument, but there's not infinite perspectives, right? You have to actually collect information, facts, facts. It's got to be facts, right? Facts means 
There's something that's real. There's something that's empirical, that's checkable, right? When you're on the playground and the bully punches you and you punch back, there's a distinction between the punching back and the original punch. They're not the same. How things come about when someone comes into your house, right, to rape your daughter and you defend your daughter and you kill them because that was the only way to save your daughter. That's not murder, but that's something else. That is killing in defense of a field of value. I had a long conversation on this topic, right? Well, not that long, but a you know, moderately long conversation with the Dalai Lama when I was in Dharamsala. And we talked about this notion of utter moral equivalence and how devastating it is. There's not moral equivalences. You know, there's a, a gentleman who writes in the United States who I have not tracked closely um, I've listened to five or six of his presentations and take issue with some very, very core assumptions that he makes that I think are flawed. His name is Sam Harris. But on one issue, I think he's done a, a brilliant job. And this is actually where I encountered his work, where he did the, the complete audacious thing, you know, maybe it was a decade ago, of challenging Islam and challenging this notion of moral equivalence in which you weren't allowed to critique the way Islam was expressing itself in the world. And Sam was right. The fact is, and this is a, a tragic fact, but a true fact, is that every, this is point three, every religion has its text that it should be embarrassed of. That's true. Every religion has shadow. That's absolutely true. And, and, a religion needs to evolve in accordance with its own values in order to align with the broader field of value. So what do I mean by that? So if in the Torah, for example, which is the sacred text of Judaism, there are a set of texts that talk about when the Israelites conquer ancient Canaan, Right? There's a, a kind of injunction, kill everyone. That's tragic. And that was the nature of the ancient world. And so, a few hundred years later, right, several thousand years ago already, about 2,500 years ago, the readers of that text said, that text cannot be fulfilled because we can no longer in this world identify anyone by their place of origin, and so the Talmud, third century says, at a particular moment in time, it marks that moment in time as the Assyrian kingdom, you can no longer identify a person by their place of origin. So none of the texts from the ancient world that suggest that you can attack a person based on their racial source are valid. They are all nullified. All those texts are nullified. And that was the fundamental position, right, of the Talmud in nullifying, right, any text that would allow for distinguished distinction in moral treatment based on racial origin. Christianity has tragic texts in the book of John, right, which were used by Goebbels Right, in World War II, Goebbels, the, the minister of propaganda for Nazism. And Christianity has evolved and said no to those texts and rejected those texts, right? And, and actually stood for, right, a wider and more beautiful and deeper world. Christianity has gone through a profound evolution. And yes, there are shadow forms of Christianity and there are shadow forms of Christian theology, and there's dimensions of Judaism that need to be evolved and transformed evermore. But both Christianity and Judaism have, at the very core of their establishments, gone through 
an experience of what I would call the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of love, which caused texts to be challenged and up-leveled and evolved and transformed in a very fundamental way. In other words, let me just say it a little differently. Judaism and Christianity interpenetrated their experiences of waking up to an experience of the divine, to an experience of ethos, with a second experience, which was an experience of growing up to higher and higher levels of consciousness. So that they began to reject texts, the current Pope, for example, the current Catholic Pope, right, has made a very strong position of moving towards, right, a sense of, right, long overdue in the Catholic Church, maybe a thousand years overdue or more, maybe 1700 years overdue, but towards right, a deep evolution, right, in transformation of consciousness. Tragically, the most dominant forces in international realpolitik, which root themselves in Islam, and Islam in general, has not gone through that same interpenetration with values of universal sisterhood, universal brotherhood, the emergence of the feminine, the dignity of the body, universal human rights, that hasn't happened. Right? The, the experience of Islam interpenetrating with a kind of enlightenment, a renaissance, the kind of the values that emerge from the renaissance, the positive values right, of the universal sisterhood and universal brotherhood, that actually didn't happen. When Sam Harris pointed this out in his own form, and I read maybe one article that he wrote about it, maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was a long time ago, he got brutally attacked by the emergent woke communities. But Sam was right. It's actually correct. So let's just be really clear. The, and the movement and even reporting what's happening in Israel, and this is, I don't know what point we're up to, let's call this point five. So I'm just going to give you one example. I, I read the Boston Globe at about 5 a.m. this morning. And the Boston Globe describes right, the, what happened as this kind of moral equivalent, right, battle between the Hamas fighters and the Israeli soldiers. And then it describes how the Hamas fighters, right, went and rampaged through Israeli communities, right, including a, a nature festival, right, in the south of Israel. So let me be clear, Hamas f fighters were not rampaging, right, through Israel, meaning rampaging, meaning breaking windows and even roughing people up a little bit. No, that's not what they were doing. Right. The, 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 the tragically educated and horrifically twisted culture of Hamas, which basically views people outside of Deir al-Harb, of the nation of, the, of, the, of Islam as being those who are subject to destruction by the sword, for example, entered a nature festival with thousands of Israeli kids, teenagers, and basically massacred them, massacred hundreds of kids, butchered and massacred. They didn't rampage, right? They sought the most vulnerable civilian populations and went and rampaged and massacred, and then went into houses and massacred families, men, women, children, with intention. That's been actually part of the fundamental methodology of Hamas. They didn't rampage. This is not a moral equivalent story. And I am deeply aware, I am deeply, deeply aware of the complexity of the Middle East. I lived in Israel for many, many years, number one. Number two, I lived in a home in Jaffa, in Arab Jaffa with an Arab family with great love and delight. Right, number three, I've taken you know, major stands in Israel about how we need to work and coexist, right, and share, right, and, and create a, a, a shared sense of value with our Arab brothers and sisters. That's all true. That's all true. And 
if you follow and trace carefully, get beneath the news, right? Read, right? Real grounding documents and trace the storyline of how this is developed, which I can't do in this short presentation, you will understand the following. Israel is, with all of its complexity, with all of its tragedy, with all of its imperfections, of which it has many, a thriving democracy, right, based on a sense of universal human rights, Hadassah Hospital at the center of Jerusalem, which is grounded in the ethos of the Israeli democracy, serves every Jew and Arab that will enter with Jewish and Arab doctors working side by side. There was a reason it was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. There is tragically no other capital other than Israeli Jerusalem that would actually allow for the existence of a Hadassah hospital where you could go in and know that you would be treated fairly and, and beautifully and gorgeously with devotion. Right? That, that would not happen in any Arab capital, any place in the Middle East. And certainly there'd be zero chance of that taking place any place within the province and realm of Hamas. Let's just understand that, right? The Hamas Iran nexus, whose overt covenant is dedicated to the annihilation, right, of Israel, would never allow for a Dasa hospital, that, that's a joke. But Israel does. And the failure, right, to actually distinguish between these different structures and levels of consciousness, right, is utterly destructive. So when I open, right, I must have read this morning five or six accounts in different mainstream outlets of the Western press. And I see, right, things like, Right, Hamas fighters rampaged in an Israeli festival. No, they didn't rampage in an Israeli festival. They massacred hundreds of high school students. Those are not the same. And, and, and if we trace the history of the story, and I spend, you know, thousands of hours tracing the history of, of how the story began, let's say over the last hundred years, right? since maybe the last 150 years. What's very, very clear is the following, and I'll make it very, very clear. I'm gonna try and summarize it. The overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of the Israeli population has been willing time and again to make peace, right, and to share the space and to share the land. Right, in some appropriate way within this arena, without going through all the history right now, there are 21, 22 Arab states with vast amounts of lands and reserves. There's one tiny Jewish state. That Jewish state itself right, has been willing right, to make a thousand compromises for the sake of peace and there has not been an ethical, stable partner for peace on the other side. That's simply true. That's, that's an undeniable fact, right? And if you contest that fact, you actually have not traced the story. Simply, there have to be facts. There's got to be some ground of fact. That's true. Again and again and again left-wing Israeli governments, right-wing Israeli governments. And when, when someone in Israel or a group of people in Israel violate the basic shared ethical values of human rights, including Arab human rights, right? Remember Hadassah Hospital. If you read, for example, right, the charter of ethics of the Israeli army prepared by Professor Asa Kasher and others in Israel, you will read one of the most profoundly shocking, gorgeous ethical documents ever written in human history. 
And that's the aspiration of the Israeli army. And when someone violates that, they're court-martialed, they're sent to prison. Yes, the system breaks down at times. Yes, there are aberrations. There are always aberrations. But those aberrations are the exception to a very strong rule, which the overwhelming, overwhelming majority, right, of the Israeli population holds. By contrast, tragically, right, on the street that's controlled by Hamas in Gaza, for example, just as one example, when someone sees an Israeli car, sees children in the back seats, shoots into the car at the children, at the parents, and kills them, as has happened time and again, time and again, happened to people in my family, happened to me driving a car with my child in the back seat, although I managed to get out at that particular time, right? That's standard practice to become a martyr, right? That person becomes not an outcast, right, but a hero. Now, again, this is not because Israel has a powerful army and there's this weak and disempowered and the only method they have of political discourse is terrorism for Hamas. That's not the case. Right? The reason the situation exists is because Hamas has incarnated right, a utter rejection of the fundamental values of universal human rights, the fundamental values of universal fairness, the fundamental values of the honor of the feminine, the fundamental values of, of fact-checking and truth. The fundamental values of, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? And based on that rejection and based on the distortion of Eros, which expresses itself in a distorted love story, a tragically distorted love story in which love means, love means not even love of my people, not only just love of my people, that's, it's much worse than that. Love means I love only my people, but I love only my people who adhere to a very particular and narrow interpretation, right, of the law of the prophet. And that narrow inter interpretation of the law of the prophet has to include utter commitment to the annihilation of the state of Israel, which is in the very core charter of Hamas. And if you don't adhere to that, or if you assert, for example, the independent integrity and autonomy right, of the feminine, independent of its service to the masculine, which is all, this is all in the charter right, of Hamas. If you reject that, you're in violation of the law of the prophet. So for example, honor killing, right? Killing a woman, right? Who is suspect of having quote unquote fooled around with someone, right? Is completely legitimate. And no evidence need brought, it needs to be brought that the woman was actually in violation of this ostensible moral turpitude. One merely says one was engaged in honor killing. Check out, there's an enormous amount of information, an enormous amount of empirical data gathered on how honor killings happening, happen. Or, or if a man right, in the world of Hamas has proclivities towards being gay, so there's a major Hamas leader killed a bunch of years ago for being gay. Killed in a brutal, horrific, torturing way. So Hamas represents, right, the cruelties, the shadow of a medieval world in its most brutal forms. So we can't skip this, my friends. We can't skip this. We can't go to moral equivalence. And I know this is going to be for some people an unpopular position. But if we can't actually stand for a shared grammar of value, then the whole thing collapses. So all of this was point one. Okay? Point two is big. And let's go to point two. We need to create a, a culture of Eros. We need to create a culture of Eros. 
a universal culture of Eros and a culture of Eros means, stay close, a culture of value. And these are very deep things. If you're here for the first time this week, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing together many things we've talked about many times, specifically beginning from now. But, but a culture of Eros is a culture of value, meaning when we articulate in this new story of value that we're committed to unfolding here in One Mountain, Many Paths and at the think tank at the Center for World Philosophy and Religion, when we articulate a, a series of interior science equations, which articulate a shared grammar of value, which is what we're doing, and among them as the first equation, we articulate an Eros equation, right? Eros equals the experience of radical aliveness desiring, seeking ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. We're talking about Eros as a value of cosmos, right? Eros is a value, which is, right, deeper contact between, between parts, between life forms, between separate parts seeking to create deep and profound intimate communions. Eros, that's the structure of cosmos that begins all the way down the evolutionary chain and all the way up the evolutionary chain and to create larger holes. Right, in which all the parts have a place, in which no one's outside of the circle. So that eros is a value of cosmos. So it's not that there's eros and value, there's eros value. There's a field, right, of eros value. Now, now stay close, and it gets very subtle, it gets very deep here, okay? It gets very deep, it gets very subtle. So this field of eros value is a structure of reality, and it demands something from us. And it demands our devotion. It demands our sincerity. It demands our generosity. It demands our gratitude. It demands our service. It demands the pouring of our unique gifts into the healing and transformation of the whole. It demands a relationship to the whole, right? It demands the the realization that we are unique expressions of goodness, truth, and beauty. And that each of us has a, a unique instrument to play in this larger unique self symphony, but this unique self symphony in which we're all playing our unique self instruments is held together, grounded in a shared score of music. And that music is the ground of value. It's the ground of Eros, right? It's the intimate universe. If we don't embrace that and instead we actually articulate a deconstruction of value. We actually say, as one of my colleagues does, there is no value. All values are the same. There's no difference between medieval values in which Christians go to the Holy Land to kill Muslims and contemporary democracy as one well-known proponent of postmodern discourse argues, one that I've cited many times, this is not a moment to cite people by name and critique, this is a moment to stand together, so I won't cite the name. But when one makes that argument, when one says there is no field of value, all value is completely made up. So what you do is you arouse in that utter deconstruction and denial of the field of value, you actually arouse Hamas, right? Because Hamas, as a, as a phenomenology in the world, as a force in the world, listens in and says, oh my God, the West has just deconstructed and denied value itself. There is no value. There's nothing to sacrifice for. There's nothing to stand for. There's nothing with which we need to align. There's nothing before which we need to kneel. There's nothing that elicits our devotion. There's no larger frame. There's no larger story. There's no reality that demands our service. When that's true, when that claim is made, that claim, which is a false claim, which is an absurd claim, that claim which empties reality of significance, which empties reality of eros, which empties reality of value, leaves a gaping wound, a gaping gash, right, in the very heart of cosmos. So in that emptiness, in that collapse of eros, in that failure of eros, in that 
failure of a story of Eros value, what arises is pseudo Eros. Pseudo Eros. False love stories. Narrow ethnocentric love stories that brutalize the other, that degrade the other. But what fuels those pseudo erotic love stories is a desperate desire to affirm value. And so value is affirmed as my people, my Allah, my Christ, my tribe. And then of course, and this is part three, two other pieces play. It's part three, two other pieces play. One is shame. So I want you to get this, this is deep. So in the pseudo erotic love story, where love is limited, A, to a very small group of people, so everyone outside of that group is not worthy of love, is not to be loved, is not to be honored, can be degraded and dehumanized because actually everyone outside of that circle of love is actually considered to be not fully human and therefore can be slaughtered at a nature party without regard, with intention, that's rooted in this fundamental shame. Now, now stay close, okay? Stay close. This is, this is so deep and it's so tragic and it needs to be understood. That shame, that shame is rooted in a degradation of the experience of desire and love itself. That shame is rooted in a degradation of the experience of desire and love itself. So one, the degradation of love, right? When, when you tell a person, when you murder someone outside of this narrow circle, that's not murder, that's for the sake of the Lord, for the sake of Allah. That person's interior sense of the mystery, that person's interior sense of goodness, truth, and beauty, that person's interior sense of anthroontology, the ontology, the realness and goodness of cosmos that lives in me is violated. Do you think you can paraglide from Aza into Israel, into a nature party and slaughter dozens of teenage women and actually not experience a profound revulsion and shame about who you are? Do you think you can participate right, in that kind of slaughter? And that kind of destruction of love or that kind of limitation of love. I love only this small group. No one else is worthy of love. Not only are they not worthy of love, but they're worthy, of, they're worthy of the worst degradation. Do you understand that the, the shame that that causes? That's number one. It's the shame of, of your own interior degradation. That's one. But, but there's a deeper root chain, right? We're all in number three now. There's a deeper root chain. And the deeper root chain is that your very desire itself has been degraded. In other words, in Hamas's vision of reality, which was also that of the Catholic Church till very, very recently, but it, it, it rains in Hamas today and it rains in Iran today. That's why Masha Amin and and hundreds of Iranian women were tortured and killed in the last year, including high school, high school girls. Because the story of desire they told is that desire itself is fundamentally degraded. And that sensual desire is fundamentally degraded. And that the, the, the sense of, of goodness and truth and beauty that lives in the body is fundamentally degraded. So when you degrade desire, and yet that desire continues to live and to rage, right, in the young men of Hamas and the young men of the Ayatollah 
Revolutionary Guard and the young men of the quote-unquote military wings of Hamas and of Hezbollah, that desire continues to rage. And so the self-experience of the young men is that we are degraded, that we are fundamentally impure, that we are fundamentally revolting to the divine, that we are somehow disgusting to the divine. And so there's this internal sense of shame and there's this inability to trust the core experience of the body. When there's an inability to trust the core experience of the body, when there's a fundamental degradation of desire that lives in a human being, then the human being becomes alienated from their own capacity to trust themselves and to trust their, their moral sense, to use an outdated 18th century term, to trust their deepest participation in the field of Eros value. All of that gets alienated, gets truncated from a person's inner heart, and a person no longer has access to the whisperings of goodness, truth, and beauty that live within them. That's huge. So, so we have to, we have to get this, right? There's a, at the core of the Hamas narrative, there's a degradation of desire. That degradation of desire causes fundamental shame. Shame means the experience, not that I did something wrong, that I am wrong. And that experience that I am wrong is so fundamentally painful that we can't live with it. So we cover it up. We cover it up with pseudo eros, which are fantasies, fantasies in which love lives in this very narrow place between me and my very internal narrow set of people and everyone else outside of their circle of my circle as an infidel to be butchered and killed for the sake of some illusory fantasy of purity. It's like, wow. So this is, this is, this is deep. This is deep. Now stay in, stay in, stay in, stay in, stay in. Let's stay really close to this. Let's stay really close to this. This is point four, but it's, 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 it's illuminating point three. What we need to do is, in order to respond to this pseudo eros, we need to actually establish eros. In other words, that which gives rise to this pseudo erotic fantasy of purity is the sense of shame, shame at my own murderousness and failure of love actually aroused hatred to anyone outside of my circle, right? Shame at the degraded, ostensibly degraded desire that lives in my body because desire itself is degraded. All of that shame alienates me from any sense of my ability to actually participate in the field of value and to know the goodness and truth of beauty that lives in me and be guided by that goodness, truth, and beauty, which creates an unbearable pain inside of me that needs to be covered over by, by pseudo eros, AKA read Hamas's covenant. And you'll see pseudo eros, right? A flame in all of its most horrific disguises. But again, number four, what gives rise to that is the claim that there is no value. Right. In other words, in other words, when the classical liberal position of the Western world says there's no value at all, there is no field of value. Right. So then the response to that is it says, no, no, there is value. And then that value then gets expressed in its most distorted forms. So in other words, when there's no consecration of value, when there's no altar at which we kneel, when there's no service that we're called towards, when there's no sense of a higher obligation and a higher responsibility, when there's no sense of devotion or sincerity or, or generosity, right, or ethos, when none of those exist, right, as intrinsic features of cosmos that, that invite us, that honor us by demanding our participation and dignifying our capacity to participate, when none of that exists, when there's a field that's, that's devoid of eros and value, then pseudo eros rears its head in the most horrific ways. In other words, 
when you destroy a healthy experience of my whole self, of my sanctified self, right, of my holy self, of the holy eros, right, that lives in me, then you create an experience that's so fundamentally painful for the personal and the collective that every form of fascism, every form of breakdown, every form of humanism, every form of regressive, degraded expressions of hatred come together as organized forms of pseudo-eros, read Hamas. So when there's no holy eros, there's only pseudo-eros. Which means, number five, that the only way to respond, the only possible way to respond right, to this degradation is by articulating a new story of value, which is real, which both evolves through us, which we incarnate in our very being, and before which the mystery before which we bow, before which we're in service, before which we're in devotion, right? And it's if we can't articulate, right, if we can't articulate a new story of Eros value, a new story of desire, then it all breaks down. And, and let me see if I can deepen this in point six, okay? So we said last week, right here in One Mountain, we said, When we read, you know, the, the, the text of the movie Barbie, to which we will return, we said the core point of this text is there's no love story in Cosmos. And that any notion, and the text is quite explicit in the movie, any notion of value is made up. Human meanings are made up. We live one life, we die, it's over. And any meaning we had along the way, we simply made up. That's the position that Hamas is reading. That, that's what Hamas is understanding as being the bedrock of what they call the West. And they're not entirely wrong. Right? It's a big deal. So Hamas, Hamas responds by an utter degradation of Barbie and a kind of extreme horrific expression of patriarchy at its worst, right, through the role of the masculine in Hamas's ideology. That's actually what happens. But what's our response? The response is the Barbie movie? That's response one. A universe in which there is no love story, in which everything's just a social construction. But then a second expression of that universe becomes, now stay close with me, becomes a pornographic universe in which desire is digitally mediated and you have a complete overwhelming of the senses which are deluged by images of incarnate desire which are dissociated from larger fields of divinity and larger fields of dignity. And as we have you know, Billie Elias, right, the singer, writes that she grew up from age 11 on high-speed internet porn, which was fundamentally degrading and fundamentally violent from age 11, right? And I've had so many men walk through, right, my office in different ways and talk about from age 9 and 10, right, growing up on high-speed internet porn with no sense of a narrative of desire, of reality that's desire, of reality that's a field of desire, of the unique desire and unique script of desire that lives in me, as me, and through me. None of that's available. So it's deep. And it's, we need to articulate a new ground of desire, a new story of desire. And to be homo amor is to be able to live and incarnate that new story of desire.
Let, let me try and say it like this. Let me try and say it like this. We've talked about for the last, since 2011 or 12, Zach and I wrote an article on what we called the second shock of existence, the meta crisis and the second shock of existence. I don't know the, remember the exact name of the article now, if you see it around Zohar, maybe, maybe throw it in the chat box, but, but don't open and read it now, friends. But what we mean by the second shock of existence is as follows. And I articulated this distinction in a, in a series of, of talks in Holland in like 2009 or 10. And my friend Mauk, right, articulated the second shock after those talks and, 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 and wrote about it, the second shock and unique self. But, but let me just try and say it now in a couple of sentences. The first shock of existence is the experience of the human being that I'm going to die at the end of this life. There's an experience of death. That experience of death forces me into myself, presses me to the wall. Rilke writes about death pressing me to the wall. When death presses me to the wall, I have this much deeper realization of who I am and what value is. And perhaps I'm, I may actually generate a realization of the continuity of consciousness beyond death. Death presses me into life. Death presses me into gnosis. And in the original experience of what we, we call in the story of value, which we call cosmotic humanism, in the original experience of the first shock of existence, which is the knowing of death at the dawn of humanity, we're pressed against the wall of existence, if you will. We go deep inside and we begin to generate knowing, knowing of value, knowing of goodness, knowing of truth, right? Fields of meaning. And it takes thousands of years for those fields to evolve, but it's the encounter with death that actually pushes us into the realization of value. Do you remember the the last scene that we saw in the movie about a year and a half ago, we did a deep analysis of the movie, Don't Look Up. And there's this realization of death that finally, finally people realize existential risk, right? A meteor in this movie is gonna hit the planet. And there's this last scene where they all gather, right? The, the kind of heroic figures in the movie and they have dinner together in the last minutes of reality, right? And they realize, oh my God, what matters is, is eating together. And, and loving each other and, and saying grace together and, and, and clasping hands and giving each other a hug, right? And, and opening our hearts and loving. All of a sudden, in the face of death, you realize, oh my God, this is what value is. My son wrote in a family text thread last night. It says, all I wanna do is I wanna be at home with, with my three kids and, and with Adas. I wanna be at home. He said, it doesn't matter, nothing else matters to me. I just wanna be at home with my family. And I'm not saying that's the only value. That's one set of values. It's a beautiful value. And when I encounter death personally myself, right, I'm, I'm desperate to love. And one of the ways I'm desperate to love is to write this great library at this time between worlds and download it into reality and to actually stand for this new great library and this new story of value and to pour every ounce of my energy and effort into making sure that we can actually articulate this new story of value and actually drop it into reality, download it into the source code of cosmos as a gift for, for thousands of years to come. But death presses us into gnosis. And so that original experience of the death of the human being pressed us into gnosis. And it also moved us to create families. Oh, this is a family, this is a father and a daughter. And a father doesn't take advantage of his daughter sexually. She's not a sexual object. The father protects the daughter. That emergence of the father, right, the, the couple, right, the family, right, the clan, right, the lineage, the, the perpetuation of, of family, right, the wider family that gathers and holds each other, right? right? These are all emerged from the first shock of existence. Now we're coming to the second shock of existence. Now stay close, friends. And, and maybe let, let me just add one more thing. So in the first, before I get to the second shock, in the first shock of existence, one of the things we did is we looked at sexuality. And we looked at sexuality and, and Zach and Christine and I talked about this last night. We looked at sexuality and we said, wow, there's this wild force in cosmos called sexuality. And we tried to create containers to hold it. And some of those containers were beautiful. We tried to create containers 
to hold sexuality, which were all forms of ritual and all forms of, of guidance and all forms of, okay, this is fallen sexuality and this is sacred sexuality. And some of it we got right and a lot of it we got wrong. But there was this attempt to create containers, right, to hold the erotic, to hold sexuality. We now come to the, the second shock of existence, okay? And the second shock of existence is not the death of the human being. The second shock of existence, the potential death of humanity. So just like the first shock of existence pressed us into new knowing, new gnosis, new forms of family, new forms of the sexual, new visions of meaning. So now the second shock of existence also has to press us into new value, new emergent value, new stories of desire, new visions of a sexual ethos, new visions of the erotic and the ethical. And it's, we need to actually come not to a place where we deny value, not to a place where we deconstruct all value, when we're actually faced with the potential death of humanity, the second shock of existence, we need to be again pressed against the wall of reality into disclosing new visions of meaning, which means new sexual ethics, a new ethos, right? New visions of what eros means. And instead of the ancient world in which virtually all sexuality was in some sense diminished in its sacred character. And the only true sacred sexuality was often that of the priest and priestess, the king and the queen, or the priest and the priestess who engaged in heros gamos, they engaged in sexual coupling for the sake of the people. But all other sexuality didn't have that status. There was only, there was only the sexuality of the king and the queen for example, that had ultimate value of the priest and the priestess. And often they would engage sexually, right, in a temple ritual for the sake of the people and then be put to death as a sacrifice, as a sexual death sacrifice. That was the Heros Gamos, the divine marriage in the ancient world in which there was this realization that the power of the sexual needed to be harnessed. But it was harnessed in a way in which it resulted in an actual physical death and it was reserved for the elite. We're now at this new moment in which actually the old ethnocentric world of it's just my people and we love only my people doesn't work. We actually face global challenges and we need a global grammar of value. And we actually realize that actually it's not about just the king and the queen, that every human being is royalty. And there's a sense of universal human rights and there's the emergence of the feminine. We then begin to realize that we need to actually claim what we might call the democratization of Harris Gamos the democratization of Harris Gamos. In other words, my sexuality, the sexual current of desire that lives through me, not the one mediated by the pornographic universe, not the script of my desire that was stolen from me and imposed upon me by the most reductive forms, right, of broken capitalism that actually markets to 10 year olds high speed internet porn and that robs 10 year olds right, that become 15 and 20 year olds of their ability to access and arouse their own unique field of desire. Not that. We need to liberate ourselves, right, from the tyranny of a pornographic universe that erases our scripts of desire and actually reclaim my own sexuality, reclaim myself as the priest and priestess, reclaim myself as the king and queen, right, move towards, right, a democratization of Harris Gamos. In other words, where the second shock of existence presses us into but a new narrative of sexuality, a new narrative of desire. It's not that sexuality is sex negative or it's not just bland sex positive and it's not Kinsey, the sex researcher, researcher, sex neutral. It's just like having lunch and it's not sex sacred because it creates babies. No, it's this dem democratized realization that sexuality desire is the nature of reality, that the name of God is desire and that desire is the currency of reality. Reality is eros desire and that Eros desire lives uniquely in me and that in my sexuality, I am a unique incarnation and expression of the entire field of desire. And because I feel sexual desire moving in me, which is a desire for pleasure and fullness and the goodness of life. 
and the desire to give and share that with someone, I'm actually a priest and priestess of the new reality. I'm a citizen of this new global world and my sexuality is sacred and needs to be protected and honored. And I myself need to distinguish between fallen sexuality and sacred sexuality. And I need to access my deepest heart's desire. And I need to access right, my own unique self script of desire. And we've written an entire phenomenology of Eros, which I'm not gonna talk about now, which talks about seven levels and seven kinds of sexuality. And what is the, the sacred version of each and what's the shadow version of each. So we need to actually reclaim a new narrative of desire, right? Which is our response to shame, right? Shame is, right, when there's a degradation of desire and that desire lives in me, then it makes me feel aberrant to myself. But when I actually honor the dignity of desire and I realize that desire lives uniquely in me and I realize that my sexuality with myself, if I live by myself or with another is the divine marriage. It's me marrying all the parts to myself or me in relationship to other. And if I actually begin to say that, no, that sexuality is so sacred that anyone that I've even felt sexual arousal towards, I need to be in devotion to my entire life. Of course, I don't need to act on any of that sexual arousal. I can be classically monogamous my entire life, but honor my entire field of desire and honor everyone's field of desire and realize that everyone's a king and queen, a priest and priestess engaged in a unique Harris Gamos and that actually the bed of sexuality is the bed of ethics and the bed of value, that all value lives in the sexual experience because it's about devotion and it's about giving and it's about giving and receiving being one. And we need to reclaim right, the, the experience of the sexual as a model of Eros as the most sacred dimension of life. That's an alternative right, to the degraded visions of a pornographic universe, right? That's a sexuality that we stand for, that we live for, that we die for. When we realize that actually our own two essence and our own throbbing and our, all, our own pulsing is the pulsing of God and goddess. Right? you begin to see this, right? Like, wow, you begin to see this vision? All of that is absent. So all of that, that entire culture of Eros we just described is absent. Does everyone get that? That entire culture of us doesn't exist. It's half. It does, doesn't exist anyplace. So in that absence, you get pseudo eros. And in that absence, you get degraded visions of desire. Hamas has built on a degraded vision of desire and a degraded vision of the feminine. So of course it slaughters teenage boys and girls in the field because it's filled with its own shame. But of course, the Western liberal world hasn't put a powerful, compelling vision, a grammar of value to, to which we are in devotion, which is, which is deeply articulated, which is felt. Right? We, we worship only the altars of our own narrow narcissisms. So we need to actually create new altars, to create new visions of value. And finally, the last point. Here's the last point, and with this we'll finish. The other dimension that then mixes in, and this is point six or seven, right, is what we might call, right, what, what mixes in with the degraded worldviews, right, that are expressed, right, in Iran today, and in Hamas, right, and in Hezbollah, right, right, what mixes in are essentially what we would call in, you know, if we can bar Tolkien's imagery, right, from Lord of the Rings, talk about the Ring of Sauron. And the Ring of Sauron is actually the dark, degraded ontologies of evil that live in the world. In other words, the lack of Eros creates pseudo Eros. When there's no genuine Eros, there's pseudo Eros, where there's all forms of acting out, and all forms of addiction and all sorts of power drives, right? That seek to cover over the emptiness of genuine Eros. But those pseudo erotic power drives have enormous power. They're fueled by a kind of pseudo-erotic ontology of evil. And evil is not just the absence of good. Evil develops its own appetites, its own hungers, right? The hungry ghosts of Buddhism have a kind of ontology. They have a kind of power. And of course, that was depicted in Western literature as the devil. But while the devil is absurd in its grotesque and caricature depictions, what's not absurd is that there actually is 
a battle between good and evil in the world. Sorry, I said it. There actually is. And that battle between good and evil exists in every human being. There's a battle between, right, the part of me that wants to be gorgeous and stunning and the part of me that wants to be contracted. So just find the moment when you're in a fight with someone and they accused you of doing something wrong, right? And you don't want to acknowledge that you might've done something wrong, even if you did, you want to lash out and destroy them because you feel shamed. So what do you do? What do you do? Do you actually respond from your fullest self and say, wow, you just point out that I did something wrong. Well, let me just look in. Oh, wow, there's something to that. I, wow, I, I apologize. Oh, wow, I really own that. Thank you. And, oh, and now let me share something else and then go on to the next part of the conversation. Or are you triggered in shame? Am I triggered in shame? And I lash out to destroy the person. That's right, that battle. Right. Can I reach deep in myself and find my joy? Can I find my love? Can I find my generosity? Can I show up when it's impossible to show up? Right. Can I be in devotion when I don't want to be devoted? Can I be fierce when I need to be fierce? Can I be fearless standing for the field of value even when it's not comfortable politically and I, I may lose some egoic standing in the world? Right. Can I be aligned with value? That battle between good and evil exists in every person. It exists in every community. It exists between people. There is a battle for good and evil in the world. Sorry, it's true. No, it's not the old mythic version of the battle with the good Christians against the bad Jews or the good Muslims against the bad Christians or, 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 or you know, ancient early versions of the Bible 3,500 years ago, which is the good Jews, right, who are doing their thing, right, who are kind of going to destroy Canaan, right, which, which already immediately, right, the Hebrew wisdom tradition said that's not valid. Now, we got to evolve beyond that. We totally need to evolve beyond that. Absolutely. The old mythic versions in which it's very easy to say, I'm the side of the good and you're on the side of evil. It's very easy to get caught in the battle of good and evil and make myself the good and everyone else evil and demonize the other and not see them at all. We get that. So we need to reject that notion of the battle between good and evil. And there's a battle between good and evil. That's actually true. There are two kinds of forces that exist and live in the world. That's actually true. And there is, Tolkien wasn't wrong when he talked about the ring of Sauron. And he talked about the nine kings, right, who are seduced by, by the ring. And what is the ring? The ring is a circle. And circle is always a symbol of circle eros. And circle eros is, is a particular kind of depth in reality. And the nature of a circle is that it's not trying to get somewhere, it's for its own sake called lishma, for its own sake. The circle is for its own sake. So that quality of a circle, the ring, right, of Sauron in Lord of the Rings, which is for its own sake, in its beautiful version, I want to sit and have a conversation with you for its own sake. My son wants to be with his family for its own sake. We want to love each other for its own sake. That's beautiful. But there's a shadow of for its own sake. And the shadow of for its own sake is the, the, the desire for power over for its own sake. The desire to assert my power by inflicting pain on the other for its own sake. The desire to avoid shame by asserting my superiority, right, through the utter degrading or murder of other, right, right, this move for its own sake towards the destruction of other. I create a circle, everyone else is outside of the circle. I create a pseudo eros. I'm on the inside because everyone else is outside. And I'm driven by this seductive drive for power, the ring of Sarah. And power becomes the value itself. So in other words, what happens is, let me see if I can get this clear, pseudo eros exponentialized becomes the ring of Sarah. And the ring of Sarah is called precious. Right? Remember, it's called the, the hobbit who becomes evil in the the Tolkien trilogy of Lord of the Rings, right? He talks about the ring and he says, my precious, my precious. What does precious mean? Value. So the point is the ring becomes value, but it's really anti-value. It's the pure raw drive for power, which overrides all value. There's no sense of eros. There's no sense of devotion. There's no sense of kindness. Do you remember the orcs? The orcs are the, the manufactured brigades right, of quote unquote fighters who go out to fight for Sauron, who massacre everything in their way. 
Those orcs have no kindness and they have no sexuality, right? And no sexuality that's beautiful. And they're, they're lost in pornographies of violence. Those are the orcs. Yeah, there is a battle between good and evil, but it's not between individuals of racial origin. It's not good Jews and bad Arabs or good Christians and bad Jews or, right? It's not a good Chinese and bad Americans. Not, it's, not, it's never about racial origin. It's about what's the system of value in which we live? What's the grammar of value in which we live? What's the story of value in which we live? There is no child born into a Hamas family that cannot grow up to be a gorgeous, good, true, and beautiful, noble human being, a noble knight of goodness, truth, and beauty. There is nothing intrinsically broken or fallen about Jews or Arabs or Christians or yellow or brown or black or, or red. Of course not. Right? It's about what is the story of value? Am I engaged in the evolution of consciousness, in the evolution of love, my evolving value? Am I actually accessing my deepest heart's desire? Am I trusting my capacity to actually be a responsible agent and player motivated by my deepest heart's desire? Or have I demonized my interior desire? I can't trust my desire. And so therefore I'm controlled right, by a story of value which is built on the degradation, destruction, the murder of other. Friends, there is a battle between good and evil. And we do need to take a stand in that battle. And it's not all real politic. And it's not all corrupt. And it's not true that it's just corruption all around. Yes, there's corruption in every system. And there's no system that's not without its, its, its deep flaws. But there, there is better and worse. And there's higher and more degraded forms of value. And there is, I want to say it again, there's a battle between good and evil. And that's real. And we need to take our stand in that battle. And it's not a moral equivalence all around. Right? There's not a moral equivalence between the Russian army and the Ukrainian army. And I'm familiar, very deeply familiar with all the flaws and complexities that are happening in the Ukraine. I'm aware of that. Right? And there is no moral equivalence between what the Russian army is doing and what the Ukrainian army is doing, even though they're both flawed in many ways. But there's a very clear right, need and value to, in some sense, in some deep sense, support Ukraine in the best way possible. And that's true right? With all the complexity, it's clearly true in Israel, right? And other Israel is, right, is a, a flourishing democracy. I'm going to end with how I began with Hadassah Hospital and pluralism, right? Right at the very center of the society. It's this tiny little country, right? Which is, which has a, a, a code of ethics for its army. That is the most advanced code of ethics. It's an aspirational code. Right, that the, the army strives and stretches to live by even now in the middle of the horror. Right, warnings were given in Gaza to evacuate places where the army was going to operate. The whole thing's imperfect. The whole thing's a holy and broken hallelujah. But there is a battle between good and evil. And we can trust right, our deepest heart's desire, which incarnates our moral compass. And we do need to be telling a new story of desire and a new story of value. And we need to actually be madly committed to that story. And we need to, to stake our lives on it. And we need to be willing to bracket our narcissistic selves for the sake of the larger whole. And that's what arouses the respect of reality itself. Right? Wow. We can't have Hamas hijack God. Right? Hamas can't hijack God. The God of Hamas is a distorted and degraded God which is idolatrous, which serves tragically, right? The degraded forms of the great impulse of goodness. That is the spark that's at the heart, the original heart of every great system of value, of every great system of religion, of religare, of reconnecting. But as, as Cook, Abraham Cook writes, when you degrade your vision of God, you degrade your vision of ethos. And very quickly, you become a mass murderer, right? There is a great battle between good and evil. And our role in that battle here in One Mountain is we are going to give everything we have with, with every breath we have, not as a casual side activity, not as a hobby 
as we do our narcissistic lives, we're going to lay it down, right? To, to tell a new story of value, not just to tell it, not just to declare it. You know, Barbara Marks Hubbard, it's so good to have you, you with us here. And you began this with us and Sally Kempton, right? The two great women who, who held the center for so many years and who held this vision of value, right? So I just want to invoke them and invoke the, the, the dignity of that feminine and, and the great women and men who hold the center, right? In all of their positions of leadership, right? We are committed to actually writing with depth a great library and to grounding it in the deepest sciences and the deepest footnotes and the deepest universal grammars of value, liberating the deepest sparks from every great tradition and creating the ground of a, a world religion as a context for our diversity, whereas a, there's a place for a gorgeous, holy Islam, gorgeous, holy Islam, a gorgeous, holy Judaism, a gorgeous, holy Buddhism, gorgeous, holy Sunnis and Shiites, right? Where the tragedy of Islam is that within Islam, right? Murder reigns between every faction. Now let's have a, a shared value within Islam, a, a shared Christ field, right? We're committed to this. We're going to do everything we can to articulate in every language we can, right? This new grammar of value and to validate it, not just to claim it, to validate it. That's not a, a two-year project. That's our life's work. We're going we're gonna to try and publish it and write it and, and film it and, and share it in every way we can. And that's our fight, but we're fighting. We're fighting. We're in the great battle of good and evil. And lastly, and with this we end, with this we end, this is our amen, friends. This is our amen. We have to actually own the shadow in us, right? The only way to do, be in the great battle of good and evil is to know that it's not just binary. Any evil that exists out there in some place lurks in my heart. And so I have to find that inside of me and transform it. We say... In the text of Solomon, greater is light than darkness. And then the masters say in the 13th century, not greater is light than darkness, greater is light that comes from the darkness. We have to own our own shadows. We have to own our own flaws. We have to own our own vulnerabilities, but not with a sense of moral equivalence. Not, oh, right, we're all flawed and vulnerable. No, no, there, there are distinctions and there are important distinctions. But we never make evil solely the place where the other lives we always look deeply. We're willing to be displeasing to ourselves because it's only by being displeasing to ourselves that we can be an altar to the divine, an altar to the Christ, an altar to the true Allah, an altar to the true Atman that is Brahman, an altar to the true Adonai Elohim. Amen.